Bhagavate Vasudevaya. I'd like to read a verse from the ninth canto of Srila Bhagavatam. Yanama Sruti Matrena Pulam Bhavati Miramalaha Tasya Tirata Padakimba Dasanam Avashishyate What is impos what is impossible for the servants of the Lord? By the very hearing of his holy name, one is purified. <coughs> Srimad Bhagavatam, again and again, reminds us of the supremely purifying power of the Lord's holy name. Lord Chaitanya in his Shikshastakam has prayed Nam Namakari Bahudanija Sarva Shaktish that the Lord has incarnated within the transcendental sound vibration of the name. And all the powers, the potencies, the beauty and the sweetness of the Lord are in the name. Namachintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Rasvigra. The name of God is God. Krishna, the absolute truth, who is supremely all powerful and independent has manifested himself in the sound of the name. And as Krishna tells us in Sri Bhagavad Gita, Yegatamam prapadyante thams tatai vabhajamyaham. According to the nature of how we approach the Lord, or according to our surrender, the Lord reveals himself accordingly. When a devotee, with humility, sincerity, in a spirit of selfless service, chants the holy name, the Lord who is all pure, Om Apavitra Apavitra Va, very quickly cleanses the heart of the devotee and reveals himself within the name. This particular verse is being spoken about a great king named Ambarish, who took shelter of the Lord in the Lord's name, and therefore nothing was impossible for him. Briefly we will discuss this story. The same story that Shukadev Goswami has spoken to Parikshit Maharaj in the pages of the Bhagavad Purana. Ambarish was a married man. He had children. He was the king of all the seven islands of the world. He had such power, such wealth, such influence, and he was respected more than anyone else in the world. But he considered his wealth, his influence, as insignificant. He had no attachment whatsoever for it. Because Ambarish Maharaj knew that material things are the sources of misery. Dukalaya Mashashutam, because they're temporary, they will perish. And whoever we are in this world, whether we're just sweeping the street 
and we have a little hut in a lota, or whether we're kings who have proprietorship of the world, it really doesn't make that much difference because no one can hold on to what they have in this world. Time takes away everything. And also things cannot bring fulfillment to the heart, however much we have. And there's so much fear to the extent we have material attachments. If we're attached to fame, prestige, then we fear losing it. And we become envious of someone who has something more. And we become depressed if we have less. And if we have more, the tendency is we become arrogant. In which case, envy, arrogance, it's a type of greed which was, can never be satiated. And whether it's nature or people, or just the own, our own vulnerabilities of our body and mind, there's always fear because we can lose it. Somebody else can take it. So the predominant quality of material existence is fear. People work hard because they're afraid of not having enough. They're afraid of losing what they have. Wars are based on fear. But a devotee is fearless. How was Ambarish Maharaj fearless? Because he didn't take any of the temporary things in this world too seriously. But it's interesting to ana analyze his character. You would think a person who didn't take any of the wealth or riches or power or fame in this world seriously would just leave it behind and give it up. But he was the king. And he had more than anybody of all the things he didn't take seriously. But he never considered anything to be his own. He considered Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. Everything is the property of Krishna, God. And therefore, he used everything in the service of Krishna. And he didn't see his subjects in the kingdom to be his subjects. He considered them to be Krishna's children, ahambija pratapita. And he considered himself to be the caretaker of Krishna's property and Krishna's children. Therefore, with deep love, respect, and compassion, he served every single citizen, human and animal and plant. He served everyone with honor on behalf of God. Therefore, he utilized everything in an incredible way. And therefore, despite having so much, he was never entangled. Savaimana Krishna Padaravindayo. Very famous verse. How was Ambarish Maharaj living? Everything he had was immersed in remembering Krishna with love. With his tongue, he would speak the glories of the Lord. With his ears, he would hear the glories of the Lord. With his eyes, he would see the beautiful form of the Lord in the temple. He would see the temples. He would see holy places. With his hands, he would clean the temple. He would touch the devotees of the Lord to serve them. With his legs, he would go to holy places of pilgrimage and he would utilize his legs to go from here and there in the service of the Lord. With his head, he would bow down to the Lord. And with all of his desires, his wealth, his power, his everything, 
his mind was immersed in remembering Krishna in his spirit of service. According to the bhakti tradition, this is the perfection of meditation. To meditate on God is very, very sacred, purifying. But the highest meditation on God, samsadir haritoshana, is to meditate on Krishna, to please Krishna. Now that I have meditated and I'm remembering you, what am I going to do? I'm going to use my mind, my intelligence, and all of my physical abilities and everything I have to serve you and to please you. And therefore, Ambarish, Shukadev Goswami is praising him. Which is interesting because Shukadev Goswami was exactly the same as Ambarish and totally opposite as Ambarish. How were they opposite? Ambarish had a family and Shukadev Goswami was a brahmachari. Ambarish had beautiful palaces, beautiful clothes. He would make foods, incredible foods for the Lord and eat it with his family and distribute it. And Shukadev Goswami, he didn't have a house. He would just travel around. He would go to some cow shed to get a little milk and he would not stay in any one place longer than it took to milk a cow. In fact, he was so totally detached, he didn't even bother to put on clothes. He wandered around naked. Not as some tradition, not as some tapasya. It's just that he was so absolutely, totally detached from the world, he just didn't think about his body or covering it. If we artificially imitate that without that realization, then we become bound by karmic reactions. So here's a king in a royal palace with a crown and the most elegant robes. And here is someone sleeping under a tree with no clothes at all. But they're exactly the same. In the sense, that they were always remembering Krishna and utilizing every moment in a spirit of loving devotion to Krishna. So Shukadev Goswami is praising Ambarish Maharaj, how he used everything. And for the welfare of his whole kingdom, and also out of his humility, thinking that he constantly needed to be purified, he would perform tapasya. And it describes his wife was equal to him in every way. She had the same consciousness. She shared the same spirit of pure, unalloyed, selfless devotion with him. So to sanctify his kingdom, the world, and help all of his citizens, as well as uplifting his own consciousness, he performed one year of the Ikadasi and Dwadasi fast. And at the end he went to one of the twelve forests of Vrindavan, Madhuban. On the banks of the holy river Yamuna, he fasted for three nights, along with his wife. And when it was time to break that one year to Pasya, by breaking the fast, by eating some food, at that moment, well actually, what he did is at the end of his one year fast, he invited people to come. And before he ate anything, he fed thousands and thousands of people sumptuous prasad with his own hands. He gave 60 crores of 
cows to Brahmins, each one with gold-plated horns and silver-plated hooves. And he fed everyone such wonderful food, Krishna's prasad. First, he worshipped the deity elegantly. He dressed the deity with fine clothes and ornaments. He offered them the boga. He performed the arti. And then he gave all the prasad, massive. And just at that point, after he satisfied absolutely everyone, when it was just the time to break as fast, one more person arrived without any announcement. <laughs> one of the greatest yogis and mystics in the entire universe. Durvas Muni. And I'm Barish Maharaj. He's the king. Usually in the world today, whether it's in the east or the west, if a sadhu wants to see a powerful political figure, usually the sadhu has to bow down, kind of, to the... You have to wait in line, and the political figure does you a great favor by seeing you. But that's not the type of political figure Ambarish was. As soon as Durvas Muni came, he considered what a great, great benediction, what a blessing the Lord sent a sadhu for me to serve. He welcomed him, he bowed down to him, he offered him a very, very beautiful sitting place. And then Ambarish Maharaj said, please, I have a wonderful feast prepared to you, please eat. And Durvas Muni was very satisfied. But he said, I have to do my, um, my meditation in the river Yamuna. Let me take my bath. Then I will come back and I will accept whatever you offer. So Durvas Muni went to Yamuna. He was submerged in it and began to meditate on Brahman, on the Supreme Lord. And as he was meditating, he lost track of time. Meanwhile, Ambarisha understood, and this was taking place in a previous yuga, where technicalities were very seriously considered in the execution of our spiritual duties. And there was hardly a single mahorta left till the deadline for him to break his fast. If he didn't break his fast, then it would nullify a whole year of tapasya and all the benefits it would give to him and all of his citizens and the whole world. But if he did break the fast, he would have been violating the etiquette that you don't eat before your guest, especially this kind of guest. <laughs> So he prayed to the Lord within his heart, and the Lord was very much within his heart, and he got an inspiration. How to resolve this apparently contradictory situation we're in. Is not this the nature of the world? We get put in these contradictory situations where we're supposed to be at two very important events at the same time, and we have to choose one or the other, and if we choose one, we will offend the other people. And if we choose the other, we'll offend these people. We want to please one person, but then you have no time for another person. This is our limitations in this world. And in order to deal with that, we need good intelligence. And that's our sadhana connects us to the Lord. We may not be able to please everyone, but if we have the intelligence to please Krishna in this situation, then our life is perfect. So Krishna in the heart of Ambarish Maharaj gave him an idea. But he didn't act independently. He approached 
very learned, pure-hearted Brahmins and told them, this is my idea. To drink a little bit of water is simultaneously to not eat and to eat. Drinking a little water will break my fast, but drinking the water does not consider eating before your guest. So they all said, yes, this is according to the scripture, and this is according to highest wisdom. Drink your water, O king. So he just drank a little tiny bit of water, and then stood eager to serve Dravasamuni. Dravasamuni came out of Yamuna, came to the house, a little place. But by his mystical powers, he understood that Ambarish drank water. He was extremely offended and erupted into a tantrum of anger. You call yourself a king? You are the lowest of the low. You are a cruel, hard-hearted rascal. You have no power to control your senses. You have no respect for the Brahminical order. You have no respect for anyone. You are simply selfish. You have eaten before you feed me your guest. You deserve to be punished in a way that you will never, ever, ever forget. After blaspheming this person who just tried to do good for him, isn't that the way the world is? Sometimes you really try to help someone, you try to be kind to someone, but maybe you make a little mistake, or maybe you don't make a mistake. They just interpret it in a different way, and they become your enemy and try to destroy you. Through last money, besides saying the most horrible things against Durvasa, he grabbed a bunch of hair from his head and pulled it out. You have to be really angry to do something like that. <laughs> Whoever you are. I guess that's why in the Brahmachari Ashram it's safe. <laughs> No matter how angry you may get at another Brahmachari, there's no hair to pull out. <laughs> but he would, this is real anger. And not only that, but Durvas really didn't comb his hair, so it was all matted hair. To, so you know, for any of you who have ever had matted hair to pull it out, it's really an ordeal but he could not control his wrath. He pulled out a bunch of hair, and with a mantra, with his eyes red like coals, and his eyebrows in all kinds of contorted figurations, he threw the hair on the ground and chanted a mantra. From that piece of hair was born a massive demon made out of fire. He was roaring. The universe was shaking. And this demon was howling with the same anger as Dravasa Muni. It is described that what Durvas Muni had created was this fiery demon that had the power to, to burn the universe. And he looked with his fire eyes at Ambarish and growled and leapt at him to burn him to ashes. Oh, because he drank a little water? <laughs> well, for most of us, we'd say, my Lord, why is this happening to me? Or for sure, at least we try to run away. 
Ambarish Maharaj did not move an inch. He did not have the slightest anxiety, repulsion, or fear in his heart. Ambarish Maharaj did not think anything ill of Dravas Muni. He simply folded his palms and offered his heart and his life to Krishna. My Lord, I'm yours. Nothing else matters. I'm yours. Because he surrendered in such a state of forgiveness instead of in such a state of love, the Lord who promises in Gita, Konteya Pratijani Hiname Bhakta Pranashati. For those who surrender to me, I always protect them. But he protects his devotees sometimes in ways that are not exactly what we understand as protection. He may protect us by smashing us. He may protect us by taking everything away from us. He may protect us by not giving what we want. Or he may protect us by giving us everything. He may protect us by letting us die and go back to Godhead and take our soul back to Godhead. Or he may protect us by saving our life miraculously. But the Lord always protects his devotee, and a devotee has faith in the Lord's will. And that was Ambarish. He just stood and just offered his heart to Krishna. And Krishna sent his Sudarshan chakra, who appeared like fire. It was the chakra and there was fire emanating it. It was burning hot. Now this is extraordinary what was about to happen. Dravas Muni created a fiery demon made out of raging fire that had the, the, the heat to destroy planets. And the Lord sent the Sudarshan Chakra which was emitting fire. The Sudarshan Chakra attacked the fiery demon. And according to Srimad Bhagavatam, the fire of the Sudarshan Chakra burnt a demon of fire, burnt him to ashes. <laughs> this is not only inconceivable, but incredible. How could fire burn fire? How could fire burn pure fire into ashes? Krishna did it this way just to show. What is that beautiful verse? Mare Krishna, Rake Ke, Rake Krishna, Mare Ke. That if Krishna wants to kill you, nothing can save you. And if Krishna wants to save you, nothing can kill you. And Krishna is not subjected to the laws of nature. Material nature, it's impossible for fire to burn fire. Yes? Fire is unburnable because it's burning. You put out fire with water, not with fire. Have you ever seen a fireman? <laughs> There's a blazing building and they come with torches and start throwing the burning torches in the building to put out the fire. And they come with those, you know, those fire guns. <laughs> torch throwers. And people say, what are you doing? We're putting out the fire. Perpetuating the fire. They use water. The Sudarshan Chakra didn't use water. Just to show that Krishna can do anything. He has Achinta Shakti, inconceivable potencies. And these impossible, miraculous, inconceivable potencies are always there to protect his devotees. So after this fiery monster was burned to ashes, then Sudarshan attacked Durvasa Muni, who created this fiery monster. And Sudarshan was so red hot that it burned 
Ambarish Mahara, I mean Durvas Muni, even from a distance. So when this fiery monster approached Ambarish, what did he do? He just stood in one place and offered his heart to Krishna. When the fire of Sudarshan approached Durvas Muni, what did he do? He ran away. He really ran away. And he was a fast runner. <laughs> if Durvas Muni were to go to the Kali Yuga Olympics, <laughs> he would be the first person in history to win gold medal in every single event. <laughs> every sport, every race, everything. He could jump higher, he could throw balls better, he could do everything. He would be the undisputed captain of the Indian cricket team. <laughs> And with no need for help from any of his teammates, he would win the gold cup every year without exception. But he was a mystic. So he ran away, and Sudarshan ran after him. And when he ran, he ran. He could run. We could run on the land. He could run anywhere. It described he went to the top of mountains in the most inner recesses of mountain caves to hide. And right behind him was Sudarshan. Now here's another incredible, impossible thing by material standards. Are you ready? Thank you. <laughs> Even if you said no, I would probably... Formalities. <laughs> Sudarshan was blazing on fire, yes? Durvas Muni, he used his good intelligence. What am I going to do now? He's burning my back. Durvas Muni ran to the bottom of an ocean. Now, can fire touch you at the bottom of an ocean? Yes if it's the Sudarshan Chakra. <laughs> if it's the will of the Lord. He's at the bottom of an ocean to protect himself and he feels the blazing fire heat. You know, the bottom of an ocean is a very cold place. And he's feeling the massive heat of Sudarshan on his back. So he had to go out of the ocean and run into the sky. He was running in the sky so fast he went to the abode of Brahma and fell at Brahma's feet and said, please save me. I offended Vishnu's devotee and Vishnu is very angry with me. Please save me. And Brahma said, when Vishnu just moves his eyebrow, the entire universe is destroyed, including Brahma Loka. <laughs> My residence. There's nothing I can do for you. It's seen from this story between the lines that Brahma did not want to be implicated in this <laughs> Devasmini's offense to a devotee. So there's nothing I or Shiva or anyone can do for you because the Lord is all-powerful. So the last morning, feeling the heat of Sudarshan behind him, he ran through the sky to Kailash where he fell at the feet of Lord Shiva and begged Shiva to protect him. Vaishnavanam yata shambhu. Shiva's a great Brahmin. Shiva are both Acharyas, founder Acharyas of two Sampradayas. Brahma Sampradaya, the Rudra Sampradaya. 
Shiva told him that all the demigods, everyone, we are all subordinate to Vishnu. But I can tell you how to save yourself. No matter where you go, there'll be no protection. You must go to Vishnu himself and surrender your body, mind, words, and life to him. So Dravasmani went to Vaipunta. This is what kind of runner he was. <laughs> and there he fell at the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu and prayed, please, I beg forgiveness for my offense. Save me. And Vishnu spoke words that have echoed in the hearts of devotees for thousands and thousands of years. Where in this situation, very lovingly, the Supreme Personality of God had revealed his heart out of mercy to Durvasamuni. The Lord said, I, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, am completely controlled by the love of my devotees. Although I am the supreme, absolute, independent Lord of all that exists, I have given up my independence by my own independent will to be controlled by the love of my devotee. And what to speak of my devotees? I am conquered and controlled even by the devotee servants of my devotees. The servant of the servant of my servants. He explains how my devotees, they are, they have given up everything for me. Therefore, it's impossible for me to give up them. They carry me in the core of their hearts and everything they do is for my pleasure. They are so satisfied with serving me that they do not want even liberation. Even the four types of liberation, of living in my abode, having my same kind of forms, having my same kind of qualities, being a personal associate, what to speak of mukti, or entering into the supreme Brahman, no more suffering. So my devotees don't care for any type of liberation because they're so satisfied just to making me happy by serving me. Just like a perfectly chaste wife brings her husband under control. Similarly, my devotees who are equal and compassionate to every living being have brought me under their control. And here, our beloved Guru Dev Srila Prabhupada explains, this is the quality that the Lord loves so much about a devotee. Pandita Samadarshana, is they see every living being with equal vision. When we realize our love for God within our heart, we see that the Lord is within the heart of everyone. We see that every living being is a part of God, is a child of God, is a beloved of God. And therefore, to honor all respect and to be in the spirit of the Lord's compassion toward other living beings, that spirit is so dear to Krishna that he is controlled. The spirit of compassion. Sadhava Hidayam Mayam. The Lord said that I am always in the core of the heart of my devotee. 
They're always meditating, always praying to me with love. And therefore, the devotee is always in the core of my heart. And because a devotee is willing to do anything for me, I am willing to do anything for my devotee. And because a devotee cannot live without me, I cannot live without my devotee. Even my spiritual world, with all of my own transcendental bliss, such a ananda, and all of my opulences, I cannot enjoy any of it without the love and association of my devotees. Devasamuni, because of your self-envy, you have mistreated and offended Durambarish, who is my dear most devotee. Interesting how the Lord explains it as self-envy. From a material perspective, Durvasamuni was very selfish. He was thinking because Ambarish minimize me, I must destroy him. He was envious toward Dravas. But the Lord explains, if you are envious of someone in this world, ultimately you're envious of your own self. That envy is going to destroy you. There's no worse quality. It demeans the soul worse than envy. And envy toward the... When we envy a devotee, the Lord is explaining here to Durvas, because you envy and you try to cause harm, that means you envy me and try to cause harm to me. Because I am in the core of the heart of my devotee and the devotee is in the core of my heart. So if you envy and offend my devotee, if you are envying and trying to cause harm to the very core of my heart, which is taken much more seriously than the body. Yes? On this human level, if someone hits your arm, that's an offense. But if someone shoots an arrow in the core of your heart, that's a much more serious offense, is it not? So if we offend the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then we're attacking his body. But if we offend his devotee, we're attacking the core of his heart. This is why Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained that offenses to devotees are the mad elephant offense. If we blaspheme the Lord, we're going to have to pay. But that's just a bodily offense to the Lord. But if we are envious toward a devotee who's sitting in the court of the Lord's heart, the Lord is, that's envy toward the heart of the Lord. 